Suppose we want to answer the question of whether a firm gets more cost effective, less cost effective, or neither as it increases its output quantity. In economic terms, this concept is called returns to scale, and there are three possibilities. Let's examine each possibility in turn. Increasing returns to scale, also called economies of scale, basically represents a situation where it's cheaper to be bigger. And we have a number of ways of explaining this. The first way we could show this is by looking at total cost versus quantity produced. And if a firm exhibits increasing returns to scale, then you'll see that despite the fact that total cost increases as quantity increases, it increases at a rate slower than the quantity. So if we were to compare this to, for example, a straight line, we see that we start getting a slower increase in the rate of cost than we get in the increase in quantity. Another way to see this is instead to look at average total cost versus quantity produced. In this case, if a firm is exhibiting increasing returns to scale, what you'll see is that as quantity increases, average total cost decreases. In practice, we might observe increasing returns to scale for a firm either literally because they're getting volume discounts on the materials used in production, or alternatively because as they get bigger, they're more able to specialize labor. So for example, they don't have their factory workers also doing some bookkeeping and vice versa. They're able to use people in the most effective ways possible. Or they're able to buy more specialized machinery, which you can think about as specialization of capital, which will also allow them to make their product at a lower average cost. Another way to think of increasing returns to scale is to look at what happens if we double all of our inputs in production. If we have increasing returns to scale, then if we double all of the inputs into our black box of production, we get more than twice as much output as we got before. Alternatively, we can think of this as we could get exactly double our output with less than twice the input. So again, this just represents a situation where we're able to use our resources more efficiently as we get larger. Now, one thing to remember here is that when comparing the two situations, you have to remember to double all of your inputs, whether those inputs be capital, labor, materials, etc. Because I don't want to confuse this with concepts of diminishing marginal product of labor, diminishing marginal product of capital, which is a situation where we're only changing one input and holding a, every other input fixed. Now, it's really easy to look at companies like Walmart and assume that bigger is always better, but that's actually not the case. So our second scenario to investigate is what we call decreasing returns to scale, and it represents a situation where it's actually more expensive to be bigger, or alternatively, it's cheaper to be smaller. Again, we can see this in a number of ways. We could look at total cost versus quantity. And notice here that as our quantity produced increases, again, our total cost is increasing just because it costs money to produce more stuff. But we'll notice here that it's increasing at a rate that's faster than linear. So our cost is increasing at an accelerating rate compared to our quantity. This corresponds to a situation here where if we looked instead at average cost versus quantity, we would see that when we have decreasing returns to scale, our average cost is increasing as our quantity is increasing. Again, another way to think about decreasing returns to scale is to ask yourself what happens when I double all of my inputs in production. In this case, if we see decreasing returns to scale, we'll notice that when we double all of our inputs, namely we put twice as much stuff into the production process, we actually get less than twice as much stuff out of the production process. So we're being less efficient in turning inputs into outputs when we have decreasing returns to scale. 
Alternatively, we can think about this relationship as if we hypothetically wanted to double our output, we've got to put more than twice as much stuff into the process in order to get there. Decreasing returns to scale might happen because as you're producing more, you need to have more managerial overhead, you may find it more difficult to get the best employees for the job, you may experience other sort of coordination problems that make the firm sort of too big and unwieldy as you continue to increase your production. As a last option, we can have what are called constant returns to scale, which just represents a situation where it doesn't really matter in terms of cost effectiveness whether you're larger or smaller. So we can see here, with a firm that has constant returns to scale, we could look at total cost versus quantity and notice that total cost is just a linear function of quantity. In other words, total cost is proportional to quantity and it's just increasing in a linear rate. It's not increasing at an accelerating rate as we saw with decreasing returns to scale and it's not increasing at a decelerating rate as we saw with increasing returns to scale. This is a little bit easier to see when we switch over to look at the relationship between average cost and quantity when we have constant returns to scale. If we have constant returns to scale, it's neither more nor less efficient to be bigger. So it's not surprising then that average total cost is constant when we have constant returns to scale. Put another way, if a firm exhibits constant returns to scale, then if we put twice as much of all of the inputs into the production process, then we get exactly twice as much output out of the production process. Again, you want to remember here that we're considering what happens when you double all of the inputs and not just one. So for example, we have to double labor, materials, capital, anything else that we're using in this process in order to be able to figure out what's happening in terms of return to sc returns to scale. In the case of constant returns to scale, you can think of this as it doesn't matter in terms of cost effectiveness whether you're bigger or smaller because your average cost stays the same regardless of what your quantity of output is. In most cases, companies have a U-shaped average cost curve, as we see here. What this means is that they enjoy economies of scale, or increasing returns to scale, up until a certain point, and then they start seeing decreasing returns to scale after that. Put another way, we can say when the average total cost is decreasing, we have increasing returns to scale. And when the average total cost is increasing, we have decreasing returns to scale. Intuitively speaking here, this behavior of this U-shaped average cost curve comes about because for a while you're getting cost benefits from being bigger in terms of volume discounts, labor specialization, and so on. But then once you pass a certain point, which is actually different for every firm, you get too big to be able to be managed effectively. You end up with too many layers of management, people not knowing what other people are doing, coordination problems, and so on. So usually you start to see this behavior here once you get past a certain point. One notable exception to this is what's called a natural monopoly. A natural monopoly is a company that sees decreasing average cost or increasing returns to scale over all reasonable levels of output. So even though hypothetically, maybe if we go at such huge quantities that they'll eventually stop seeing cost effectiveness benefits from being bigger, we're not actually ever getting to that point because it takes so long for this U to actually turn around. So we can compare what we see with most firms, which is this U-shaped average total cost curve, to a natural monopoly, which actually by definition is a company where it's always cheaper per unit to be bigger. And we'll come back later and see what some of the implications for a firm being a natural monopoly are in terms of whether they should be allowed to exist in a market by themselves.